The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss winterizing your garden, what you should do and maybe what you shouldn't do, as well as using those apples and pears, several different options we have for you. Our guest is author and self-pronounced garden nerd, Christy Wilhelming, will be with us and will answer your garden questions. The hour's full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another edition of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program and taking time out of your day to allow us to be part of it. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Happy you've tuned in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2024. In 2023, 2024 is next year, huh? Uh, in 2023, through our parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, underneath the season seven tab at the top of the page, in studio video replay, podcast replay, however you're doing such, thank you very much. You want to be part of the program, participation. You can do that. Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. That's Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. Send us an email with your question. Say hi. Let us know where you're listening from. Or you can give us a call uh, toll free, coast to coast at 1 800 927 show. That's 1 800 927 7469. Winterizing your garden, Holly. Now, this past week here where we originate out of our flagship station, Joy 1340 AM and 98.7 FM out of the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area, we've seen heat indexes uh, exceeding 100 degrees. Now, I know there's going to be somebody somewhere listening to the program, whether live or on replay, Holly, that'll go, oh, 100 degrees. We still wear sweaters when it's that cold outside. Well, we didn't. And it was warm. Uh, but summer will end soon and fall will follow and then winter will come. That's how it always works out, at least uh, in the, the years that I've been around. So winterizing your garden, Holly, there's some things in which we want to do and things that we don't want to do. And we're going to try to identify those in this segment here so you can have the best next year as possible when it comes to your garden. Yeah, so you want to decide when. So or if. Yeah, or if, I guess, too. If you live in a much warmer climate in the south, maybe you don't necessarily winterize your whole garden or maybe you don't winterize um, at all. But if you live in a more northern climate, you would decide based on when your plants might stop producing. and Or you might do this in chunks, like you might... For example, you might have some squash or pumpkins that are going to grow through the fall or even possibly potatoes or you planted some fall crops. And those obviously don't want to winterize until they're done. Right. Now you're looking at Brussels sprouts or lettuce or radishes and those things can handle the brassicas. Those things can handle a, fr a frost, a light freeze. But when most of our listening audience and most of the stations, there's going to be a point where snow is going to hit the ground and temperatures are going to be below freezing. Now, prior to that, you want to look at what do you need to do? What do you not need to do when it comes to the garden? One thing that many of us will need to do if we do have an irrigation system from dripworks.com or, or other places is we need to drain it. If we don't drain it, the water freezes and will rupture the hose or pipe and or damage the emitters that we utilize in order to get the water to the plants we're trying to grow. So there's a couple of ways in which you can do this. One, in our situation, we have a feeder hose or a feeder line that we connect to in order to get the smaller line into our beds and water our plants. So what we do is we uh, have that underground all the way to the end of our beds. At that point, that line does come out of the ground. So we open that line up and allow gravity to push or allow water to run out of the feeder line. In addition to that, we take a vacuum, 
a home a household vacuum that blows air as well as it will vacuum air. So you can use a shot vac or an upright if it has that capabilities. And we physically tape the nozzle onto the end of the hose that comes out of the house that would hook into the faucet. And we run it for about 10 minutes to blow as much water out of that line as possible and throughout the whole system. There is going to be some residual water left, but the minute, minute amount of water left in there when freezes is not going to do the damage as if it was completely full of water. So you want to drain your line. If you've got bird feeders or uh, bird baths or some type of water in which you are utilizing for animals to bring them into your yard, you don't have to drain it. There are devices in which you can incorporate into, let's say, a bird bath or a water bath feature in which will keep the water from freezing. There are heating coils that set in the water that will keep it at, you know, 40, 45 degrees. It's not like 90 or it's not a hot tub, but it will keep them from freezing. And the birds can still actively drink the water as well as other insects and or if your water feature uh, can still operate. Right. So that's that's um, yeah, definitely. So then the other thing is, is that you want to think about pulling your plants. Do you or do you not? Right. What, what is the right answer or is there a right answer? Well, so you can pull your plants. Maybe you don't want them sitting upright. You don't want you don't want to look at them or whatever. You want to either compost them or you want to lay them down in your in your garden. Like mulch? Them? Yeah, like mulch or because a lot of um, insects do utilize mm-hmm. them for their homes. And they'll, they'll utilize the stem that has been dried out. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to think about that. If you do have any diseased plants, you want to trash them. Don't burn them. Don't burn them. Don't compost them. Don't leave them in your garden. Literally put them in the trash. So that's one thing is is that if it is diseased or you think it might be diseased, get rid of it. Now, again, we we have done the, the, the wrong, so we can tell you, not purposely, but when we started gardening, we would wipe the garden clean in the fall, take everything out, throw it to the curb or compost it, and it was, a bare, it was bare. There was nothing left. <clears throat> and then we realized the amount of insects, good and bad, that would utilize under the leaves or in the stalks of plants, or if you leave your sunflowers up or other ve- vegetation that has seed pods still on it, the birds will still come in and feed off those seeds well after. After you're out of the garden and the season is over. So you we leave it until spring. In, and here's another thing. Even we in spring, we always like to say March, April, we get like two or three days of 80 degree weather and everybody thinks, oh, we got a plant. And then we get like three weeks of freezing rain or freezing temperatures again and some snow. The mistake is made that people will go out there in those three days and wipe everything and get everything ready to go. Yet there's still winter and you're destroying beneficial insects that are in those plant stalks that you would need to harbor, to reproduce, and to stay in your garden whenever the the green and the summer comes. Absolutely. Yeah. So you want to keep that in mind. The other thing is is that if you have something where perhaps you have up um, tomato cages or trellises or whatever, and you need to think about storage. So maybe you don't have a shed. Maybe you want to utilize part of your garden bed to lay those down uh-huh. and put a tarp over them. Think about, you know, unique ways to store them. Maybe you can fold everything up nicely and put it in a huge plastic tub or something like that. Think, you know, most of those things will be okay if you leave them up. They might rust a little bit faster than if you had a garage or a shed. But if you do want them to last a long time, laying them down in the garden, putting a tarp over it, is perfectly fine too. If time allows, there's been the last handful of years for you and I where we've gotten in the garden right at the end. We've planted garlic. A couple of weeks later, we continue to har- harvest tomatoes and whatever else we can. And then it's like tomorrow's snow and we've got to harvest everything and that's the end. And stuff sets there until spring when we get back in the garden. Yeah, that happens too. But having a plan, especially if this is maybe your your first garden or you want to change things than what you have done in years in the past or you are trying to find a, a better solution. Or you're an individual that doesn't like the vis- visualization of yeah. stuff, you know, dead and standing up and you want it to be all nice. Or maybe you're one of the Memorial Day to Labor Day gardeners right. and you're right. like, well, it's done now. I'm done. 
season is over. So which, which it's not. Which it's not. But you and that's but it's valid. So another thing is this to keep in mind, and we've talked about this several times, is using the leaves, uh-huh. utilizing the leaves, and just um, just a reminder to to think about that. And you could also, if you wanted to, take some of your compost and apply that now, if you have a lot extra, perhaps, or something, and then that would get would give you more room in your current compost. Well, and the leaves themselves, even if you don't want to apply them for various reasons to layer them on the bed because you think you got to pull them back off until the soil just go in the corner and just build a as big of a mound of leaves as you can because however big of a tall mound of leaves you can get back in a pile by the time march april comes around it's going to be reduced by about 50 percent and you can still you know take and fill put them in the wheelbarrow and use them around plants and as a living mulch or a native mulch or whatever you want to call it natural mulch and that will benefit the the leaves do have nutrient value more so for the mulch aspect rather than an MPK. Right. And yeah, they're just they're just a positive benefit to your garden all the way around. And people it? pay to have these things hauled away, I guess, you know, well, city taxes. But anyway, you know, people will work hard to get them to the street to get somebody to get rid of them. And here yeah. You and I, and I'm sure others who are listening, have done everything they can to pull those leaves back in off the street or uh, utilize them in specific areas of their property. Right. And that's that's something that is um, is kind of your choice. But we're just telling you now that the leaves are very useful. And if you've never thought about it or considered it or it's never even crossed your mind, now you know. Yeah, and you in in northern climates you can do low uh, road covers or, or or low tunnels or high tunnels, and in some of the southern areas that listen to the program on on replay, you can grow the cool weather crops during our winter months. Well, your winter months too, but the the, the mildness of your area it contributes to the ability to grow those cooler crops that we can only grow in the spring and the fall, and you guys can grow it through the winter time when we have multitudes of inches of snow on the ground. Well, Holly, Walton's Incorporated, waltonsinc.com, offers a wonderful coupon code, and they have magnificent products for everybody, Whether no matter whom you are, whether you're a meat processor, a hunter, or you just want some really killer great seasonings for what you're cooking. They have all of that and more. Yeah, um, in many areas of of the country, it's going to be bow hunting season, so you might want to think about what you might do with that meat. And Walton's has everything but the meat. They have equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. They also um, have dozen. They have decades of experience in the meat processing industry. And they bring that to the home processor. If you go to meatjust6.com, that's an educational site on the hows of and whys of meat, meat processing. And it's just delicious spices and seasonings and all those good things that they, they have there as well, waltonsinc.com. So you can go to meatjust6.com or waltonsinc.com if you use code GROW50 to save 10% off your orders of $50 or more. It is Walton's everything but the meat, and they will help you out. F- uh, Fifty uh, save ten percent on your orders or fifty dollars or more by using what is it? Code Grow Fifty G R O W five zero. Yep. When we come back, apples and pears. We've got some thoughts and ideals of how you can utilize them when you harvest them or purchase them. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. 
dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. You put a lot of time and energy in your garden, but without a rescue Japanese beetle trap, you can kiss that hard work goodbye. Asparagus annihilated. Raspberries ravish. Green beans, forget about it. Get those little invasive pests out of your garden and send them where they belong inside a rescue Japanese beetle trap. Now with available refill lures, rescue Japanese beetle traps can be used for multiple seasons. They're made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot com. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. Dripping Springs Oreos Clay Pot Irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oreos, O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products that last a lifetime. They're built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from Rocky Mountain source materials, are soft and comfortable, keep your feet warm and dry, and come with a lifetime guarantee. Even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High-quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. They fit in with all the many things you do from around the house to the outdoors and beyond. They are comfortable and long-lasting. These socks are great for gardening because they keep your feet so comfortable no matter the conditions outside. It's hard to overstate how amazing these feel to have warm, dry feet as you work in your garden. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at grip6.com. Use coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at grip6.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Hey, thank you for being part of the program, whether you're a longtime listener or a first-time finder of the program. It's the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, talking gardening and all things landscaping and everything in between. Before we get into what you're going to have the options to do with apples and pears, Farm Defense has some tools that will help you, not only picking apples and pears, but anything that you have to do in the garden. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense has made a wicking material and UBF protection factor 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. So let's talk about using those apps, the apples and pears. Yes. And uh, any, I guess any any other fruit that might. Well, be we're going to focus on apples and pears. Apples uh, and pears. Apples and pears. Oh my! And then there's like another fruit. Maybe is it a persimmon that's like an apple or pear? I don't know. Oh, we, this is not rehearsal. Okay. This is the radio. <laughs> we're, we're doing this for the for it's everybody. A, yeah. It's the everybody the, can hear us when fruit, we talk to each other. The now. fruit guessing. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Or yeah. All right. Well, anyway, you can do lots of stuff with apples and pears. Whether you have your own orchard or a few trees, or you go to a pick your own farm. Or you, you find them at the farmer's market or roadside stand. There's a lot of things in which you can do with these two fruits. What's my favorite fruit, Joey? Pumpkin. No, that's not a fruit. I don't know. How do you know what, what my favorite fruit is? We just went over this. This is live. <laughs> they, they can hear us while we talk. Apples. Apples are my favorite uh, fruit. Okay. All right. And I don't like those garbage apples. What's like, the garbage apples? Like green apples. Okay. I well, don't like them. So, somebody is just tuned out yes. because they, well, I like green apples and if that girl doesn't like it, I'm done with the show. Well, to each their own. So anyway, I don't judge anybody for eating green apples. I just don't like them. So anyway, you can can them, which probably seems obvious, but maybe you don't know that. So you can can them. Um, pears, apples, it's really easy. You can create a light syrup or you can can them in their own juice. You can add cinnamon. You can, um, yeah, 
you can you can make it happen and then it's nice because you have the they're a little bit soft once you can them but then you can add them to like a fruit salad or you can add them as a side easy side for dinner something like that or just like a nice little dessert and you can can those apples in pears. Well, if you don't want to can them, you can certainly dehydrate them and make apple chips or pear chips. And or you can make apple tea and pear tea by the dehydration and then the rehydrating in water. Don't look at me like that. People yeah, do we, this. I know, but we tried it and we I didn't mind it. You don't you didn't care much for it. I I it didn't tastes, mind. it just I don't know, there's something I didn't like about it. But that's okay. okay. All right. So yeah, you can you can dehydrate them for that reason. You can make pies, which is Obviously, a good use of them, and you can, you could even use your canned fruit to make that pie. You just want to make sure you drain it really well. Now, do you but have to? Do you have to when you can that to make your pie? Or you're talking about you know, we water bath it, right? Yeah. Do we need? Do you have to use it as a apple pie filling or pear pie filling, or can you can the, the fruit itself and then? You would just can the fruit itself okay. if you don't want to do like a pie filling, right? Yeah. Okay, and both could be done in water bath. Yeah. Okay. So you can make, and what we've done, we've ta- we used to have a pear tree. Poor thing died. Nobody knew how old it was, and and it died. Uh, and we would take and make the pie, the crust, to do everything. I think that tree was a hundred years old, probably. Maybe. Yeah. And, and then we would make it and put it in an aluminum pie pan, and then wrap it in aluminum foil and put it in the deep freeze. And when we wanted, we pulled it out and threw it right in the oven, kind of like one you what you would get in the frozen food aisle at your grocery store. In the frozen food aisle at your local grocer. Right. Yes. So yeah, yeah, that was something that we did. And then speaking of pie, the pie filling, now this is a special thing that you have to get. It's called clear gel, which is mostly found online. Sometimes you can find it at a farm store, like farm. Rare. Um, general store type general of thing. General store, yeah. yeah. But it's a really, it's really fun to make. And it, then it, you, all you do is you just crack open that jar, pour it into a nine inch pie crust. And then you put a crust on top or like a crumbly thing on top. And you have a pie. Uh, it does have an expiration date, so yeah. be aware of that. Don't go buying five pounds if you only need just a little bit and you don't intend to use the, the five pounds or the three pounds or whatever. So you, you can do that. There, You can make cin- uh, apple, uh, uh, cinnamon apple, uh, applesauce uh, with your apples or pears, pear sauce. We've made both. Uh, it turned out quite well. And when you can the applesauce or the pear sauce, you can incorporate the cinnamon into it to – you don't have to wait and do that post after you open it. That can be part of the ingredients because it's a raw ingredient. It's not a um, additive that has emulsifiers or anything like that in it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So it's all it's all good. You can make something called pear chutney. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And it's a uh, it's good with some or or apple chutney. It's good with like a pork chop or a ham. It gives some sweetness to the saltiness. Would you of the meat. would you for people who don't know? It, that's kind of like uh, a fancy like j- sauce kind a of sauce or jelly. Yeah, I mean it, because it, it's it's really good even just by itself on bread. Mm-hmm. But because of the ingredients, it's in almost them. like a marmalade, but not as jelly. Right, but it's yeah. got unique ingredients that complement pork. Yeah, that in it. Well, well, a lot of people will eat applesauce with pork. Uh huh. So this is kind of similar, but it's just a little bit fancier. Fancier, I guess. Yeah. yeah, fancier. Um, we may around then, here we put jam on our meat. Right. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You can make pear honey or apple yes. honey. This takes a lot of sugar and a lot of time. With the pears, when we did the but pear, not, not time the not no, time no. the don't the don't herb. confuse people. Yeah, uh, you would take the skins, and it's been many years since we've done this because of the time it, it took. You would peel the skins off the pears, and then you would boil them down, and then it, like it was something crazy to the fo- a point of. If you had four cups of water, you would add four cups of sugar, and you'd almost create a paste, and you would cook it down until you boil more water off until it got to almost a honey consistency, and it was just a tremendous amount of sugar. Yeah. It was, it was it good. It was a lot of sugar. But it was, it was a lot of sugar. Yeah. And um, if you are vegan, because I know some vegans, not all vegans, but some vegans don't eat bee honey, you could make Because this- it comes from... An animal. An animal. Regardless yeah. if the animal is alive and yes. still alive following the... Pres- right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so you can make this because it, it, is, it is like a, 
Um, it is a honey. It tastes like honey. It's delicious. But just be aware of the amount of sugar. Yeah. Whether it's natural or not, that's still a lot of sugar that you're incorporating in to make a honey. Right. Absolutely. So, And you can make apple bread and pear bread. You can incorporate that into uh, in, in your, your bread machine or if you do it by hand, you can certainly do that. Roasted apples, uh, roasted pears, either in the oven or in the microwave is also a, a good uh, thing. If you've got a lot of them, uh, the shelf life is not indefinite. You've got somewhat of a shelf life with these because – you know, if a tomato has a week and a half or two week shelf life, you could probably squeeze out a month on apples. But as they get older, they get more punky or more uh, dried out, more styrofoamish like yeah. material. Yeah. And they don't go through the juice are very good and they're not that palatable. But, you know, you eat them because, oh, I grew them or I bought them and I don't want to waste them. So utilize them in a timely manner. So you can get the most out of what you've purchased or you've grown. Right. Right on. That's exactly what you want to do. So if you if you buy a bunch of apples or pears, you want to have a plan. Yeah. What you're going to do with them. Jams, jellies. Jams, jellies. Jams is uh, easy to make. Uh, we've, well, I've asked you this before. Difference between jam and jelly is? Jam has like the chunks of fruit in it. Okay. Jelly is smooth. Okay. Smooth. Um, <laughs> so anyway, you can make jam, you can make jelly, you can make, uh, jam and jelly there and you can make apple, like a juice jelly. Basically you just take the juice and turn it into a jelly. Mm -hmm. So there's some options there. Um, some people have those juice presses. Maybe you got one from somebody, they gave it to you. You can make juice with the Apples and pears, and they make some yeah, jelly. apple cider and apple juice. They're two yeah. different things. Uh, one's shelf stable. Well, in the grocery store, one's uh, pasteurized shelf stable. The other is can ferment. And I'm assuming you can make wine with these juices as well. Yeah, I don't know anything about that, but yes, probably could. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can make jams, jellies, freezing freezing pears is an option as well. If you don't want to can them, how do you freeze them? You would. You would blanch them a little bit, okay. or you could freeze them whole. It depends what you want to do with them. So if you want to maintain the integrity of the pear itself, you would blanch it a little bit and freeze it. Or I think you could might be able to flash. No, you wouldn't be able to do that because they would turn brown. So you would want to blanch them a little bit and freeze it. If it was something where you were just going to freeze them for recipes that they would be hidden, like maybe like pear bread or, uh -huh. or um, the, the, they're gonna, apple it, It's pie. like a tomato. When you freeze yeah. a tomato, it goes, but yeah. the, the stuff, the good stuff's still in it. Yeah. So you can. And it, make, it makes that noise. That's the noise that yeah, makes, it when makes it yeah. freezes? When it, when it thaws out. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you're not part of the dress rehearsal <laughs> right now? No. Anyway. Yeah. So freezing them option. Um, pear or apple butter. This is probably um, a very familiar uh, sauce. It, it's a sauce. It's not like, you know, you use it to lubricate this cast iron. Uh, it's not butter butter. No, I don't know how, how it got its name because, but a lot of people know, usually know about apple butter. You can do the pears too. And it's uh, something that you would want to... Um, to make it takes a while to cook down, so you basically you just take uh, mashed pears, cook them down, and then um, you just keep cooking them. You can use a slow cooker, and because of this process of how they cook down, that it still turns out sweet, but you don't have to add any extra sugar. So it's just because of the slow the slow cooking. And I've done this where you take a crock pot, and then when you make the take the crock pot, you want to vent the lid. Because if you don't vent the lid, then the... It's not going to do anything. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to end up with hot apple mush. So the con condensation needs to escape somewhere. So a jar. Yeah. So you just... Twist yeah. it about 30 degrees. So yeah, wherever yeah, you have yeah. to yeah. do. Yep. And um, or so I took like little tinfoil balls and propped the lid up mm -hmm. because we have cats and I don't want a bunch of cat fur getting in there. So, um, so yeah, you just cook this down and i think i one time i cooked it down for like almost 48 hours now do you stir it frequently or you just let it go i would just stir it occasionally it wasn't because it, it, it's a crock pot it yeah. shouldn't boil and burn the stuff to the base it's not no. like you got direct heat coming off a stove right and it so if you are you know energy conscious it might you might utilize some of your um energy a little bit you know your home energy but 
it's worth it. And that way you don't have to sit there and over a stove and stir and make sure you're not burning it. Well, Holly, summer is over and the kids are back in school and the nights are getting longer and colder in some places. And let's be honest, you have forgotten about your yard because you're tired and you just are, are giving up. But you shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. Just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards. And those Japanese beetles, they may be gone, but they're not far. They feast on your roses and berries. They probably laid eggs in your turf so they can start again next year. You can take a stand with phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granule that specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granule with a spreader, irrigate into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, but it the, is the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls grubs. And the best part about it, it's non-toxic to bees and other pollinators, plus the benefic- uh, and beneficial insects. In fact, Grub Gone has no label restrictions for use around flowering plants, so you don't have to worry about them being damaged now or later, such as dandelions, daffodils, Whatever you got, not going to have any problems. Grub Gone for Fi- from Phylum Bioproducts. Grub Gone from Phylum Bioproducts, the natural choice at phylumbioproducts.com at grubgone.com as well. When we come back, garden nerd Christy Willingham will be with us. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mark.com to shop for all your needs. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Overwatering is the top reason why houseplants are dying. Tree Diaper solves this problem by absorbing excess water up from the soil. It will store water and use it when the soil dries. Use Garden 15 to save 15% at treediaper.com. Fleet Farm has everything you need to get ready for the canning season. Pick up all your supplies from start to finish as you begin to harvest your garden. Choose from an assortment of jars, strainers, racks, and funnels. Plus, check out the wide selection of mixes, sugar, vinegar, and more. Get what you need for your everyday life, including canning, at new lower prices. Fleet Farm and fleetfarm.com. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, one to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code radio 23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a Tree Hugger Sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent 
independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated. Aqua Dash Mart. Soil Savvy. Wind River Chimes. Wisconsin Greenhouse Company. Pro Plugger. Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Moments away, Christy Willingham, author, well-known, self-identified gardener. But first, a message from our good friends at Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information and to get your garden, visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guests for this week. Yes, Christy Wilhelmi is the driving force behind GardenNerd.com. Christy believes that gardening unifies both physical activity and healthy food choices while providing a grounding, spiritual, and creative outlet. She's just, she has dedicated herself to the study of organic gardening and its benefits. She is an author, speaker, and more. She's written five books, and her latest gardening book, uh, most free, most recent gardening book, is Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden. Welcome to the program, Christy. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be back. Well, thank you for coming back on. And I'll start with this. Uh, for people who are not aware, your background is in dance, theater, and drama. How did you turn it into the garden nerd? How did you get that title? How did you acquire that uh, self-identification? I was a dancer my whole life. And, you know, somewhere along the way, when I started, I just discovered the wonder of growing food from seed. And, uh, And then after I was injured and that took me out of dance, I had already started Garden Nerd as a business. And it just sort of took off from there. It filled the space from where dance left off, dance and theater left off. And my my degree in theater has helped me with my YouTube videos and like camera presence and being a voice on a podcast and that kind of thing. So it, it's not gone to waste, even though I'm not dancing anymore. Is this one of these things that you look back on and go, maybe I was supposed to get out of dance, that accident or that injury caused me and I... That's where where my next step was supposed to be in life was the garden nerd world. I think it really lent itself to uh, moving into gardening. Um, I feel like the the timing was just so that you know garden nerd was building as my dance career was winding down. They just sort of it was sort of a passing of the baton. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know whether it was supposed to happen or not, but that's kind of how it how it turned out. Well, fantastic. So we all learn from each other. That is why we bring people on the show. What is What would you like to share the benefits of using worm castings around your plants and how they can eliminate aphids? I love worm castings because they are both a fertilizer and a pest control. And I, I've, I've talked about this kind of everywhere I go, so I'm hoping that it's mainstream by now. But in case it's not. Um, there is an enzyme in worm castings because worms don't have teeth. They have enzymatic mouth parts, and so they dissolve the food they consume. And that enzyme is called chitinase, and it passes through their digestive system into their castings. And so when you apply worm castings to your plants that are having problems with sucking insects like aphids, mealybugs, whitefly, leafhoppers, uh, the plant takes up that chitinase and passes it out into its leaves. And so when sucking insects start to siphon off the juices inside a plant, they're taking up that chitinase, and it happens to be an enzyme that dissolves the exoskeletons of those insects. So it wards off uh, insects that that <laughs> insects that suck. Um, 
you know, and they, and I, there are some other types of insect frass that um, trigger the plant's own production of chitin, which does the same thing. So it's good to have around if you're having any kind of aphid infestation or mealybugs on the undersides of your citrus trees or anything like that. Uh, I, I, my first go-to is to put down worm castings as a pest control instead of a fertilizer. Now, are, I, you may not know the answer to this, and I may put you on the spot. What, what about these jumping worms that we're all seeing across the country? There's not an answer to the elimination of them, and they're invading the native worms. So ultimately, when you add those two together, it doesn't end well. Yeah, you know, we don't have them here in California, thank God, right now. But uh, but I hear about how they are really causing a lot of problems. My my first thought in my process when I come across a, pre- a you know a problem, an insect problem or a worm or whatever, is that I go in search of a natural predator for it. And usually that's some kind of a nematode, a beneficial nematode, or something in the soil food web family that will help trigger it or weaken it in some way. And I haven't done any research around that yet, but there's got to be something out there that uh, people can help fortify their soil with, like, you know, something you can add to your compost tea probably that will help ward them off or or reduce the populations or interrupt the life cycle in some way. But uh, you have put me on the spot. I'll have to go research that. (laughs) Well, you talked about compost, so let's talk about composting. It's easy if you with a big pile and the right equipment to turn it, but many of us don't have that luxury of having equipment of that magnitude. Most of us have small backyards, limited amount of space. So what are some easy ways we can all compost in that small area in our backyards? Yeah, if you don't have room for, you know, typical compost bins are usually – Three by three by three, a cubic yard. And if, uh, if you don't have space for that and hopefully space next to it of the same size, so like a three by six area, to turn the pile from one place to another, uh, I highly recommend uh, vermicomposting because that takes up a smaller footprint. Usually it's only about two feet by two feet. And I know someone who's even kept their worm bin in their closet in their apartment or, you know, out on your balcony or patio. It takes takes in less food waste than compost bins do, but it's a start and it's some way that you can generate some really good compost, like we were just talking about, those worm castings, really essential foods for the garden and a great pest control too. But if you don't even have room for that, composting in place is something that's been done forever and really easy to do. You you know, some people will puree their food scraps or chop them up really small. I know some folks who keep them in a bag in the freezer um, until they have enough to go out and dig a hole in the ground. Uh, you can bury them directly in your raised bed, but if you have critters, just make sure it's a foot down at least. Um, and then, you know, keep track of where you're burying stuff in a trough or in each raised bed. And then when you come back to that space, like if you're going to bury stuff, um, don't plant in that space for a couple of months. But eventually you, you'll have this beautifully broken down feckened soil that will accept the next thing you plant in that space and it will thrive that's that's great information so you ha- you do have a novel that came out in 2022 called garden variety but your newest garden book is grow your own mini fruit garden what can our listeners expect when they pick up a copy and maybe if there's a unique tip tip or something that would be notable to pique their interest yeah so Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden is all about growing fruit in small spaces, and, and I do include ideas that will work for people who are growing in containers on patios or small spaces like that. Um, a, a lot of the, the concepts that I talk about are around backyard orchard culture, which is something that is very different from where most of our fruit tree gardening information comes from. Most of the time textbooks and gardening books are written with the information that's been used in farming fruit trees, kind of big areas, and they prune in a vase shape because that's how it's easier to to harvest. But for a home gardener who doesn't have a lot of space from, you know, along one wall or on a patio, a vase shape is not necessarily the most efficient uh, pruning uh, shape that you'll want for that tree because 
it's going to take up so much room width wise, you don't have room for any others. So it's a, a kind of a nice concept to, um, to focus on keeping the tree under, you know, I like to keep mine between eight and 10 feet tall. So I don't need a ladder to climb up and harvest or maybe just a step stool. And this book focuses on all the techniques that are really truly for home gardeners, not for farmers, not for orchardists, not for commercial production, and not from a university ag research perspective. It's all stuff that home gardeners can implement with their with their balconies, patios, and small space backyards. Now, real quickly, your uh, novel, Garden Varieties, uh, What for people who like a long format book, what is that about uh, to, for those people who would want to sit down and, and really read a book? Oh, sure. It's, uh, so it's set in a community garden in Los Angeles, and it's the kind of thing that, you know, when you throw a whole bunch of people together of different stripes, uh, chaos ensues, and everyone's trying to get along in tight quarters. Uh, I peppered the whole story with uh, gardening lessons throughout, so you learn something along the way as you're reading through this novel. Uh, there, are, You know, it's an ensemble cast of characters, there's romance, there's uh, life and death and all kinds of stuff going on. It's a fun read, and it's certainly something that uh, people enjoyed reading through winter when they're waiting for last frost so that they can plant. Well, some people, we, 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 when you spoke about fruit trees there, some people might say, well, it's not that expensive. I can get buy fruit at the farmer's market. Why should somebody grow their own fruit? What are some good reasons to start a fruit garden? What are some challenges one may face when trying to start a mini fruit garden? That's a good question. I know that uh, for some folks it is, you know, with the pest pressure or the critter pressure that is happening like squirrels, you know, that find your your stone fruits and steal them all the way. It can be, it can be kind of uh, disappointing to try and grow your own fruit. But for certain things, like I use examples like strawberries because commercially they're grown with, you know, it's a really severe impact on the planet. They're, they're uh, one of the most heavily pesticided crops in, you know, in the market. And they also are picked young before they're really ripe, and then they're ripened indoors with ethylene gas. And so if you're growing your own strawberries, you're bypassing that whole process and all of those impacts on the the planet and our environment uh, by doing that yourself. Now, of course, if you're wanting to grow your own fruit, it's also a chance to grow things that aren't readily available in the market. I use the example of Loquat trees, which is something you probably <laughs> can't grow where you are, but I'm in a subtropical area. So loquat trees, their fruit is so easily bruised, they are never available in the market. So you have to grow it yourself if you want to do that. So for uh, listeners in your area, that may be something like a really interesting and rare variety of quince or apples that are heritage varieties that you can't buy in the store because it's that's really what gardening is all about, is growing stuff you can't buy at the store, isn't it? Right. And you speak about the heavily pesticide. Our niece, when she tries to eat store-bought strawberries, she breaks out. When she ate our homegrown strawberries, she was fine. So there was something yeah. there, uh, and, and that's probably just one of many different examples that, that people are, and our listeners can, can relate to. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot of people are sensitive to the uh chemicals that are used on fruits in agriculture and uh and so you can definitely uh curtail that issue by growing it yourself just because you wash it off doesn't mean it's it removes the internal uh penetration of that chemical that's right yeah how, how can people we appreciate the time you've offered us uh christy how can people find out more about you how can they get your your books where can they find all that great information about you at Sure. If you can remember Garden Nerd, that's G-A-R-D-E-N-E-R-D dot -E -E com, you'll be able to find all the things. We've got uh, YouTube videos, podcasts, uh, blog, and my books are all for sale there, or they lead you to wherever your favorite bookseller is so you can get it from them locally. Christy, we thank you so much for the time you've offered us and the education, not only for Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. We thank you for that. Thank you. Have a good day. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. 
Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Need a new mattress? Choose Furlow over the other leading brands and say big, really big. Because, hey, nobody ever slept better for paying thousands more for basically the same mattress. Plus, with Furlow Mattress, you also get our exclusive lifetime comfort guarantee. Good for as long as you own your mattress. Comfort to comfort, dollars to dollars. Compare Furlow to the others, and it's obvious. You get more bed for your buck. Wake up. Sleep better. Verlo. Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. Goodbye, biting bugs and plant invaders. No More Bugs by Naturally Green Products is your answer. A product pioneered by the USDA in 14 years in business, No More Bugs has been a favorite by consumers across the country. More than a repellent, it is safe for you, your plants, pets, and home. Visit nomorebugs.net. Free shipping on orders over $50. Use code FREESHIP for me. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous, invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Time for your garden questions, our garden answers. You've got a question, send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com or 1-800-927-7469. This question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com, Holly. I want to start garlic for the first time. I am in South Dakota. Can I plant store-bought garlic? Oh, congratulations. You want to grow garlic. It's one of the easiest crops you can grow, and it grows in most of the time when nothing else will grow. But no, it is not advisable to grow store-bought garlic for several different reasons, Holly. Yeah, so especially if it's just conventional store-bought, if you mean like from the farmer's market, that's different, but for a conventional store-bought, A, a lot of the store-bought garlic is that you can buy just at a regular grocery store is grown in Asia, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't mean Well, that, it's grown in, in a non, non good, it's not grown in a good way. No, it's grown like in a hydroponic system, hydroponic system which isn't bad. It's grown just, as fast as it can to mass it's, produce. Yeah, it's grown to mass produce. Has no flavor. Has, well... Um, and a lot of times there are growth inhibitors sprayed on it and it won't sprout. If what, you, what's different than that and any other food we're eating? Right. But if you try, like if you notice, if you buy organic gar- garlic, eventually it will sprout. Mm-hmm. A lot of the store-bought garlic will just never sprout. So you want to either contact a um, a local farmer's market. Maybe you can buy some garlic from them. You might have or, a local gar- gar- garlic grower like we have in our area. There's several of yeah, those. Yeah. And, yeah. And whenever you grow your garlic and you harvest it next spring and you choose to use it in your dishes or give it away, 
Here's my recommendation. Use a quarter of the amount that what the recipe calls for if you're using fresh or homegrown garlic because the intensity is so great compared to what you're conventionally used to in the store. I think you should just use the same amount because garlic is awesome. Uh, well, you, uh, I, <laughs> you know what I mean. I know. It's very right. intense. So here's our next question. Yes. I found some irrigation things on clearance, just uh, some random hoses and stuff, and uh, I want to, you know, I want to play around with it. Is it at this point? Is it best for me to wait till spring to install it? It is best to wait till spring to install it. If you know the components in which you need, and you can get all of that on sale, and you're not buying it from DripWorks.com, coming back, there's a sponsor. Um, then that's fine. You can get the components you need, but do not install it because it's going to freeze. It, but know if you're able to get the stuff on sale, get it, you know, know that you need a, a, a main line and then you need the the connections and the fittings and, and the spigots. And if you're having emitters or you have spray nozzles, get all of the things that you need and then uh, make sure that you have what you need. And, and always, here's another thing, always get... Uh, one or two extra pieces of all the components because at some point they're going to break and you want to have them when they break. You want to be able to replace them. Uh, when we got our units, uh, our stuff from dripworks.com, I purposely got several extra pieces throughout the, ma uh, the in installation aspect of it. So, And we're using those extra pieces now. Right. All right. Uh, should I pull my tomatoes or should I harvest my tomatoes before they explode? Because it seems to happen after a rain, even if they're not completely ripe. If it's been, if you're where, where you are is like where we are, where we've had kind of a drought and, and you're not on irrigation, you're not on irrigation. Um, yeah, I would pull them before, before they're ripe. If, if there's like a big storm coming, because I know you and I experienced this before we had mm -hmm. irrigation where, you well, explain what's happening because this may not be r resonating sure. with people. So you might have tomatoes on the vine that are almost ripe or near near ripe, and you you kind of had some drought conditions. And even though you're keeping them watered as much as possible, when we if you have a a huge rainstorm coming, when that huge rainstorm hits after that, even a couple of days after that, those plants just get so much water that those tomatoes grow really quickly and they just boop they kind of just internally explode. they suck yeah. too much water up and the yeah. skin can't keep up yeah and so sometimes it's just as mild as like cracking on the skin mm -hmm. but sometimes you'll go out to your garden you'll just find like the tomato guts below the plant so i would harvest them if you think that's going to happen i would yeah. just harvest them any any pigmentation change on a tomato and it ripens from the bottom up you can go ahead and harvest them even if it's just you know if it's a green tomato and there's a little pink at the bottom you can go ahead and pull it it's not going to uh change that much or you lose that much uh uniqueness out of the flavor but you'll be able to put it on the windowsill uh take it inside and it'll be fine in a couple of days but certainly uh, harvest them early and we've not experienced that since we've had drip irrigation on our tomatoes because it's consistent moisture we've also not had blossom in rot because it's been consistent moisture the plant has been able to take up what has been utilized for the plant so what joey is saying is that if you can invest in irrigation it's worth it plants grow a lot better when it has consistent water yeah we before we had irrigation we would try to water and no matter how much you tried to water it never was enough and the plants were always stressed because you would water on a Tuesday afternoon and you wouldn't get back to the garden until Thursday. And if it didn't rain and it hadn't rained for two months or, you know, six to eight weeks, that little bit of water was gone two hours after you watered. So the plants then went back into a stress state until you got into the garden again to water. And it was more of a survival than a productive manner. And, you know, most of us um, have busy lives. And if you are a very busy person, it's worth it because you're going to get back in produce, I think, over time for what you invested into that irrigation. And most municipalities, regardless if you use one gallon or X amount of gallons, you get, you have, you get charged a standard rate. There's a block in which if you use one gallon or you use a thousand gallons, you still pay the same. And these are very uh, efficient watering irrigation systems like a half gallon an hour or half gallon or whatever. They're different emitters emit different but yeah you, you got to use that as well 
So with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it, you can do that by going to our parent website, which is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com at the top of the page and clicking on the Season 7 tab or sending us an email, GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com, and we'll send you a link to the program. Tune in to this program next week, same time, same station, where we'll be discussing the things in which you should know before building or buying a greenhouse for your vegetables and also cover crops talking about what's good to put in and what's not and what is cover crops at all and our guest is author noel johnson will be with us so until next week for holly baird i'm joy baird and we will see you in the garden